Well, good morning, everybody. It is great to be able to gather and worship with you this morning. Uh, my name is Pastor Brandon, serving here as one of the pastors and elders alongside uh, Len as well. Uh, we're excited to uh, be back in to First Peter as we uh, kind of begin to head towards the end of First Peter this morning. We're on the, uh, the downward slope, if you will. We're over 50. Wait, no, that, that doesn't sound right. Um, sorry. <laughs> Um, we are, we're on the off ramp of first Peter. How's that sound? Is that a little bit better? A little better. We're on, we're on getting off the off ramp, getting ready to, uh, land here at the end of first Peter. And, you know, we've been, we've been looking at first Peter, uh, on and off since the beginning of the year. And, um, really Peter's been riding to a group of elect exiles, people who've been dispersed all over the known world and have been uh, begun to be persecuted for their faith. And, Peter has been encouraging them and reminding them, hey, don't lose heart. Don't give up your faith. Remember that there is an inheritance, an unfading, undefiled inheritance waiting for you. Remember, don't forget, there are going to be difficult days. I mean, amen, right? We can understand that. And Peter says, listen, there's going to be difficult days, but the glory of Christ is greater. The glory of Christ is greater. And so this morning, Peter is going to kind of wrap up this summation statement, if you will, in these uh, si- uh, seven verses here that we're looking at today on, on why, what we do in the midst of suffering. How do we respond in the midst of that? Because it's not a matter of if, but a matter of when, right? If you're not currently going through some suffering right now, you're either coming out of suffering or going into suffering, okay? Which means we're all on some continuum of suffering. I mean, in God's wonderful wisdom this morning, I talked with six people about the bodily ailments this morning that are going on. I mean, is that not the truth? I mean, (laughs) that was almost as good as an amen. Thank you. You're like, that's truth right there. Oh, I'm excited to be able to look at God's Word this morning. Um, and so if you will, uh, join me in First Peter. We're going to be in chapter 4, verses 12 through 19 this morning. Um, but before we begin that, two things of important note just to, to highlight. Number one, Happy Father's Day to you guys out there. Thank you so much for the role that you play in, in uh, being a father uh, this morning. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, And secondly, I am actually getting ready to head out on vacation uh, for a few weeks, so you won't be seeing me. Nothing personal. (laughs) Well, it's personal for me. I'm going to go on vacation, but it's not personal against you. Um, And so um, I'm looking forward to some time away with my family, so if you're wondering where I'm at, um, that's where I will be for the next few weeks. All right, 1 Peter uh, 4, 12 through 19. It'll be right up here on the screen for you as well. Peter writes... Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange was happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer, or a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glory, let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, What will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads and ask God's blessing upon his word this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you, the faithful creator this morning. Lord, and we give much praise and honor to you. We thank you, Lord, for your word revealing uh, yourself to us. 
Lord, you have given us everything that we can know in this life about you, in your word. Lord, not only are you the faithful creator who who holds the universe in the palm of his hands, Lord, but you are mindful of each of us individually, the sustainer and giver of all life. Lord, is mindful of us. Lord, thank you for the demonstration of your love in Christ Jesus, our rescuer, our savior, Lord, our true hideaway, that we can rest in him, the rock of our salvation. Lord, I thank you uh, for Peter's words this morning that remind us and encourage us how we suffer well for your glory this morning. Father, as we look to your words, may you, uh, by your spirit, move them in the, into the cracks and crevices of our hearts and our minds, Lord. Renovate our thinking. Restore the incorrect beliefs and thoughts, Father, and speak against the ways in which our lives do not reflect your word. Lord, so that we may be made and conformed more and more into the image of Christ, our Savior, our Rescuer. Lord, we ask these things in his name, and all of Christ's people said, Amen. I don't know if any of you can empathize with me, but I woke up this morning and went, why do I hurt? There was an ache. There was a pain. There was something going on. And of course, the first question we ask ourselves is, what's going on? How did, how did I get that? You ever find yourself wondering that? You're looking around like, I get this question often. I got two big gashes on my hand this morning. And to be honest with you, I don't fully know where I got them. Just, they happen. Sometimes we ask ourselves, like, why is my body responding this way? Maybe you eat a certain food or you do a certain thing and you're like, wait, why, why am I responding this way? What's going on? You know, as much as we've lived in our bodies for as long as we have, sometimes they're a conundrum to us still, aren't they? Like, why aren't you cooperating with what I want to do? I don't understand this. But we believe in an intelligent creator, right? He has designed us and made us in such a way that it it just manifests and and demonstrates his tremendous glory and, and thoughtfulness. And so why are we so perplexed at times when our body does something? If we truly believe that that God um, has designed our bodies to heal themselves, and they have, right? So, So this scab here will be gone in about a week. You know that, that when, you, when we actually break a bone, the cast doesn't heal it, the body does it itself. In fact, within just a few hours, the body is, is rushing blood to a broken bone area. And w- within a, a, a few short days, it begins to make a soft cartilage across that break. And within a few weeks, it's actually calcifying and making a bone. Your body does that on its own without you thinking about it. Do you know that the liver can heal itself? It regenerates. Do you know that your intestine regenerates its lining quite often, actually, especially when there's been tragic or trauma to it? Bones grow back, old skin sheds away, eye scratches, your cornea scratches, they heal quickly, although they don't feel like it, do they? They don't feel like it. Lungs recover, minor damage when one quits smoking. It's unbelievable that our bodies respond in such a way. Do you know that even your brain can form new neurological connections, even as you grow older? You know, our response when the body responds in this way, especially when it's our own, is is to rejoice. We praise God, right? That that our eyes heal, our bones fix, that things regenerate. We, We thank God for what he's done in, quote, healing us. But it's really the way that he designed our bodies to work. Aren't we glad that we don't have to manage or think about that on our own? Like, I'm waking up every morning and I'm not thinking like, okay, do I need to breathe? Should I should I should I regenerate the cilia in my intestine or not today? I mean, can you imagine what 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 the automatic processes that your body does? Can you imagine if those were on your to-do list? Do you think we're overwhelmed now? Oh my goodness, it would be 
just way too much. We don't have to tell our liver or anything else to, to do that. We don't have to think about it for a moment because in some way we have entrusted those practices to the Lord. To, it's called that entrusting is to, to hand something over to another. God created and designed us in such a way that we don't have to worry about those things. And we entrust that for the next moment, my lungs are going to breathe. My heart is going to pump. My brain is going to synapse, hopefully a little bit, and get some formative thought across to you this morning. I've entrusted those things to the Lord. And we trust that the Lord knew what he was doing when he created us, and he continues to sustain us through his intelligent design. You know, in a similar way, Peter is uh, encouraging his readers to, this morning to, to have a like-mindedness, a like-minded posture, if you will, when it comes to suffering. God has intelligently designed these things. He knows what he's doing in the midst of this. And suffering is inevitable, just like your knee pain, okay? It's inevitable. And we shouldn't be surprised on the day when it comes but we can and should rejoice in the midst of it. Any of you ever woken up and went, man, I'm so glad I have that bruise. No, none of us. But Peter here says, listen, when you experience suffering, you can and you should rejoice because you've entrusted your soul to a faithful God. And that's really kind of the main point of our passage this morning is that suffering is joyful. Wait, what? Hold on a minute. To be honest with you, even, even as I read this passage, I went, really, God? Like, this is the main point of the passage? And he goes, yep. But look at the, look at the, the modifier here. Suffering joyfully right, in accordance with God's will. Okay? Suffering joyfully in accordance or in line with God's will. That's really it. It's not just suffering joyfully no matter what. Like, oh man, I stubbed my toe. I'm going to be joyful over that. Which, by the way, I did yesterday as well. Not fun. But we can suffer joyfully in accordance or alongside in keeping with God's will. So let's see what, what Peter here kind of highlights and how he builds this argument and builds this, uh, this really kind of philosophy of how do we suffer joyfully? Look with me at the, at the first verse. There's, here's what I love about this. Uh, Walt, if you go to the next slide, there's really like six ways in which Peter says, here, here's how you handle suffering and persecution. And I, I love that Peter writes this so wonderfully because he actually puts in all the imperative things that you have to do, that we have to do as those who suffer. And he makes it super easy for me. And so it, Peter, thank you. You helped me preach this. It preaches itself so wonderfully. He says this. He says, Beloved, do not be surprised. We should not be surprised at suffering. That's the active word here. Peter says, listen, don't be surprised. Why are you surprised when you get up and you wonder why you hurt? Really? I mean, come on. Like, I worked in the garden yesterday. I should expect to have some blisters. I should expect to have some aches and pains. I should... You know, that's just progressively what happens. If we do things we, with our bodies and we, we act a certain way, then we should expect to have some pain in it, right? We, we worked it. We worked our muscles. And, and Peter says the same thing about suffering. He says, listen, you should not be surprised about suffering. Don't be surprised. By the way, I've been writing for three, chap three and a half chapters to you that suffering will come. So guess what? Don't be surprised when it does. It's going to happen, right? So you can see, like, you're either going into suffering, you're in the midst of suffering, or you're leaving suffering, heading to the next one, okay? Like, don't be surprised when the fiery trial, and I love what Peter does here. He, sees, he looks at him, he says, listen, the fiery trial. And that's exactly what he's, what he's kind of getting at. Listen, the things that, that the Lord reminds us that, that, that are the refiner's fire, right? That, that help purify us, that root out the difficulties and really our fleshly at times sinful responses to them. Peter says, listen, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised when it comes upon you. And look at, and look what the reason is. To what? To test you. Do not be surprised by suffering. You see, Jesus even reminds us of the same thing in John 16, 33. He says, in this world, you will have tribulation, is the word translated there, trouble. Jesus even says, while he is here with us, you will have trouble. 
He doesn't say like, it's going to be okay. Everything's going to be wonderful. Your life's going to be great. There's going to be no more knee pain as soon as you know Jesus. No, he says, you will have trouble. And here in our text this morning, this is not the first, not the second, but it's the third time that Peter is reminding us about persecution. And he says, listen, don't act like something strange is going on. This is to be expected. Don't act like it's so strange, it's so weird. Be, be reminded when you think to yourself, wait, wait, how did this happen? Like, so how, how do we think about this? How do we go, wait, how did this happen? How do we get to the point of, of, of persecution, of tribulation, of trials in the midst of it? And I think it's really important for us to remember um, three key things when we think about how did this happen? Because we think about that, right? When we're in the midst of a persecution or a trial or a difficulty, when we're in the midst of, of suffering, our first inclination besides how do I get out of this as fast as possible is how did this happen? I think we need to remember some things and really allow these things to, to speak to the midst of our hearts and be reminded of them. And number one is this, remember that we live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen world. We taste pain and brokenness even when no human does evil to us. Think about that for a moment. Our, our world is broken. It's not the way that God designed it. And so although God's created us with these amazing bodies, they're also fallen, flawed bodies, and so they don't always work as they should. We shouldn't be surprised when we have to go to the specialist because we live in a fallen world. It's corrupt. Number two, we need to remember that we suffer because we are united to fallen individuals all around us. Is this not a beautiful picture of the church? Look around. You're united to a bunch of fallen individuals who aren't perfect because of Jesus. They just know that they need Jesus because they aren't perfect. Not a single amen? Really? I mean, come on. Nobody wants to admit it. Like, oh man, he's right. We're all sinners, but none of us want to admit it. Hold on. We suffer because we're united to them. Whether it be politically, whether it be in warfare, in family, in work, fallen sinful people are all around us. And we're not just talking about those outside the church sitting right next to you. That's what it is. So we need to be reminded we live in a fallen world. We need to remember that we are united to fallen individuals all around us. And thirdly, we need to remember that we suffer because of our own sin. We suffer because of our own broken promises, our own laziness, our own flesh, our own apathetic attitudes towards our responsibilities to follow the commands of Scripture and do what God has commanded us. So how did this happen? Well, I don't want to just say only sin, but the reality is that, like, like I said, we're in this Trial regularly. Suffering is a normative experience in this life. It is normative. Any gospel preacher who tells you that suffering is a consequence because you're not obedient enough is a lie and a false gospel. The normative means in this life is suffering because of what I just listed above. And, oh, by the way, it was a normative way in which Christ demonstrated for us. And as we're going to see here, not to let the big surprise out of the bag, but we suffer with Christ. We're united to him. So suffering is a normative part of, honestly, this magnificent ruin of, an, of a world right now. And the more that we learn to expect trials, the better we will be prepared for them. We won't be surprised. We'll go, all right, Lord, here we go. Right? So if we're not surprised at them, it, we shouldn't be surprised to them. What should we do? We should do this. This is how we should respond. Not with surprise and, oh, bother. Oh, I can't believe this is going on. No, this is how we respond. We respond with rejoicing. This is how we suffer joyfully. We respond with rejoicing because we share in Christ's sufferings. Look at 13 and 14. He says, but, best word in the Bible, but rejoice. Don't be surprised like something strange is going on, but rejoice. And this is the command here that Peter gives. He says, no, this is what you do. You rejoice insofar so, as you share in Christ's sufferings. As you share in Christ's sufferings. So what were Christ's sufferings? He was, he was beaten and bruised. He was 
Why? For our transgressions, for our iniquities, as, as Isaiah 53 tells us. Did he ever do anything wrong? No. He was an innocent man who stepped into the good works of the Father. And, and Peter here says, listen, you rejoice as you participate in the sufferings of Christ. Why? Why should we rejoice? That you may also rejoice. There's that word again. This time it, it's kind of a, a passive word that you may also rejoice in the future to be glad when His glory is revealed. Typically, joy is not our first response in a trial, is it? When we suffer, we don't go, yay! None of us do. Typically, it's an eye roll. It's a face palm. It's a deep sigh. You ever had one of those? You're like, Peter says we can and should rejoice because we get the joy of sharing in Christ's sufferings. If the perfect, sinless, spotless Messiah could be persecuted and rejected, then we should expect to as well. Think of Acts 5. In the book of Acts chapter 5, the, the, the apostles are, are going and they're preaching the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ in the synagogues day in and day out. And well, the Sanhedrin, this council of elders at that time, comes and says, you can't do that. Stop it. And they're like, uh, hold on a minute. Should we obey God or men here? And they said, stop doing it. And you know what? They physically beat them because of it, because they would not stop. And this is what their response was. This is what the response was. In chapter 5, verse 41, they left the presence of the council rejoicing, exact same word that Peter uses, exact same Greek word, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name, the name of Christ. Our rejoicing now points us forward to the day when we rejoice in full for being a part of Christ's people and when he returns in his full glory. The reason we can rejoice now in our present suffering, rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed and be blessed when we are insulted is because we are united to Christ. We demonstrated that in our, in our baptism, and we demonstrated that in coming to the Lord's table. We demonstrated that in, in uniting ourselves to the local congregation as a, as a covenant member. We are united to Him in His, not just His glories, but in the future, but in His sufferings as well. We are part of His body, and therefore our union with Him is sharing in His suffering but also his glories to come, which we will declare in communion. If we are united to Christ, then we should become more like him as well. And that's really what our outcome of, of fruit of the Spirit tends, is trying to get after. When we talk about uh, this fruit of the Spirit, this, this distinct quality about us is that we are growing day by day more into the image of Christ. More patient, more kind, more love, more joy, more self-control each and every day. And so as we are united to Christ, we're growing closer into his image. Now, not perfection this side of eternity, because our perfection only comes when we are made whole in Christ when we go to heaven. But Paul states, listen, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, Philippians 3.10. The Apostle Paul says, listen, I want to know. I, and the, the verb uses there is just, I want to know with every bit of who I am about the fellowship of Christ's sufferings and sharing in that. But you know what? In order for us to share in that fellowship, in order for us to, to be persecuted and to, be, to experience suffering, at least for, for the name of Christ, people have to actually know that we claim the name of Christ as our Savior. In order for people to persecute us, to ridicule us for our faith, they have to first know that we have it. And they have to know that we live for Christ in the first place, living a life of, of distinction. Not with honors, because none of us live with honors in this life, okay? But with faith-filled, biblical qualities. Furthermore, like I said, our faith is not a, a private accolade. It is a public declaration that we are the king's children. And so Jesus tells us and reminds us on the Sermon on the Mount, he says, listen, 
5.14, he says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people put a light, a lamp, and put it under a basket. They, but they put it on a stand, and they give life, light to the whole place. In the same way, let your light shine before others. Brothers and sisters, in order for people to persecute us for our faith, they have to know that we have it first. And so part of the way in which we rejoice in suffering, in Christ's sufferings, is that we have to know that we are believers in Christ and the one true God. We have to let the light of our faith shine brightly before others. Too often, particularly in our ever-growing secular culture, we hide our faith. We dim our light. We, we hide it. We're afraid to turn it on even. We think that the sharing of Jesus and the gospel is best left to professionals like pastors and, and missionaries. I don't know if you know me very well, but I'm not very professional. I am a fellow sinner saved by grace, stumbling to share my faith just like you are. I'm just pointing you to where the bread is just like anybody else. I don't have it. I don't know it any better. Gospel presence is not professional. Gospel proclamation is not professional. It's not true. Far too long, the American church has thought, we'll leave it to the professionals. Can I be clear with you? The scripture tells me you're the professional. The scripture tells us that each and every one of us, God desires to use in the midst of that. The reality is that I'm only responsible for my light. You're responsible for your light. Now, I'm responsible for making sure that you stay fed, you have the right energy, you have the electricity, the feed, if you will, to, to power your light and ready to show your light to others is your job. But I, we got to train one another, we got to care for one another, we got to encourage one another. But the reality is, is I can't make you turn on your light. You are the only one that has the switch to that. You have to do it. So in order for people to persecute us then, so that we can rejoice in the midst of suffering for Christ's name, we have to turn it on and let people know and be willing to suffer for Christ's sake. The call from Peter here is explicit that we have to rejoice in being counted part of Christ's body and therefore worthy of the same sufferings that our Savior went through. But again, what I think is implicit in the text is that our others must know that we are Christians in order for us to suffer. How many of us slink back from that? I'm afraid to admit that far too often, sometimes even I do. Maybe they'll just catch Jesus like a cold. Like if they just rub up against me enough, maybe I could give them Jesus. Not going to happen. Peter says, listen, if you're insulted for the name of Christ, if if you're concerned about what your coworker, your neighbor is going to say, and I hear this all the time, not just from you, but from every church that I've ever been a part of, I, I'm worried about what they're going to say. I'm worried about it's going to alienate relationship. Can I be honest with you? The gospel is folly to those who are, who are failing away and are fools. If they are going to be offended, let them be offended at Christ, not at you. Your job is to faithfully represent Christ. And he says, listen, if Christ, uh, Peter says in 14, if you're insulted for that name, guess what? You are blessed. What? Look what he said, 14. If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Why? Because the spirit of God and, and glory of God rests upon you. Why are you blessed? Because you have represented God well. Therefore, they're offended by it. In fact, this is heavily, all of this entire seven verses is rooted heavily in the Beatitudes. Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 and 11. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Jesus himself says that you're blessed when you act for righteousness sake, when you return the money that somebody overpaid you, when you do the right thing, even though our culture says that's weird, that's strange, that's not what we say is okay. And he goes on to say, listen, bless those who persecute you. Pray for those who do you ill. Jesus takes everything that the world thinks about and he flips it on its head and says, listen, if you're insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed. For our reward is not in what other people think, but our reward is in the audience of one who receives glory and honor when we represent him well, right? He says, listen, we can rejoice in sharing in Christ's sufferings. But then he, says, he gives it a comparison. In 15, he says, but don't do this. 
Don't suffer for your own sinful acts. There's a, there's a proper way to suffer. We need to suffer for representing Christ well and doing the things that he's commanded us to do, to suffer for, blessed are those who suffer for righteousness sake. But he says, but listen, let none of you, right? Here's the opposite. Let none of you suffer, there's the key word here, suffer this way, as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or meddler. See, Peter moves on to this caveat, lest people think that all types of suffering is a result of being united to Christ. He says you shouldn't suffer for criminal or sinful acts here. And what he is getting at is that if we are united to Christ and growing to be more like him, then we shouldn't be suffering as those who continue to do foolish acts that bring about suffering. But again, the Beatitudes come up right here, Matthew 5, 21 it's not just refraining from murder, right? So we think murder, killing another person. But what does Jesus say in Matthew 5.21 about this? He says, listen, you've heard that it is said of old, you shall not murder. It's one of the Ten Commandments, right? And whoever is murdered is liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother is liable to the same judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. And so I think what, what Peter is, is reminding the people about it, and is reminding us about it, that it's not just murder, like none of us have murdered another person, at least to the best of my knowledge, don't raise your hands, okay? But what he's also hinting at, because he's been talking about, really kind of hinting back at, at the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, he's saying, listen, it's not just murder, it's slander, it's anger towards your brother, it's, it's those who insult and those who speak about you fool. So not just displays so displays of anger, resentment, harsh judgment, scorning, scoffing, despising, belittling. He says, and not only theft, but just envy and greed. No manipulation or abuse of funds, no unpaid debts, and no waste of wealth or creation. Now, I think it's obvious that disciples should avoid criminal activity. If you don't think that's obvious, see me afterwards, okay? Okay. Um, but the ban on meddling, I think, is a very subtle note. It's very interesting, right? So murder, theft, evildoer, we would all go, yeah, you shouldn't do those things. But then you go meddler. What is that? What is meddling? Hmm, interesting. The term here is, is a rare compound, and honestly, it only appears here that I, that I could remember. And it means that you become an overseer of another's affairs, a meddler is somebody who desires and does oversee the affairs of another. Meddlers interfere. They usurp roles that are not properly theirs. They think they might even scheme to gain influence outside of their sphere. They, they nose into matters that are not their proper concern and offer unwanted, unsolicited opinions. They speak when protocol calls for silence. No one gladly listens to a meddler most honestly, are, are irritated at meddlers. And if a child, like, think about it this way. Maybe you've experienced this. Maybe you've seen this. If a child is misbehaving in the middle of a grocery store, I mean, fit on the floor screaming, how many of us, how many parents are going to welcome parenting advice from the cashier at that point? Yeah, not many of us. Not many of us at all. That is a, an idea, just a picture, a mental picture of, of meddling. In my house, we use the word pickles. I know it seems a little strange, but we came up with a, when somebody is worried, is meddling in the affairs of somebody else, is concerned about the overseeing of another's affairs that really aren't their role or their business, we just use one simple word. That's pickles. It's not your jar. Okay? So let's stay in our lane. Let's worry about ourselves. Let's worry about things. Now, there's a fine line, right? Because we are to worry about our brothers and sisters, okay? But there's a line where we begin to oversee another's affairs unduly. You see, as the Spirit of the Lord rests upon His people, they become more like Christ. They participate in His life. And insults that come as they live a life of righteousness, they, it proves that they are more like Christ. It proves that they're united to Him. However, the disciple is never fully complete the side of eternity, right? We're not. We just aren't. And so Peter reminds us that we should not be um, 
committing sinful acts that bring about suffering. We're not to enter into those things at all. So don't suffer for sinful acts. But if you do, it's probably rightfully deserved. Uh, Number four, Peter says, he says, listen, do not be ashamed to suffer for Christ. 16, yet, yet, if you suffer as a Christian. Now, here's what's fascinating about this. The term Christian was actually not coined by the apostles or the New Testament writers, but it was, it was put in, it was actually given to them by another. And so it's interesting and fascinating. It's the only place that it occurs to you. It says, listen, if you suffer as a Christian, a follower of Christ, one who follows the way of Jesus Christ, he says, if you suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. If anyone does, let him not be ashamed let him glorify God in that name. This kind of goes back to, to 13 and 14 a little bit, but if, if we suffer in the name of Christ for being Christians, for our faith, for representing Christ, we shouldn't be ashamed. And I fear like this is what, what stops us a lot of times when we talk about our My Circle initiative and, and sharing our grace story. We're worried about, about either not representing Christ well, we're worried about what their response is going to be, or we might be ashamed because we didn't represent Christ well. Can I be honest with you? From what I read here in First Peter, it's not a how good are you going to do, it's a go do it and whatever happens, the Lord will take care of. That's what it is. It's to represent Christ well. Do any of us do it perfectly? None of us. Not a single one of us represent Christ perfectly. But we strive and we struggle. We press on, as, Peter, as Paul says, to, to know Christ and the fellowship of his suffering. Why? How? By stepping out in faith to follow his commands, to share the gospel to every man, every woman, and every child. And so we should be. We should look forward to being shamed for sharing Christ because it shows that we participate in his suffering And in the midst of that, we can glorify God in that name. As Christians, we can glorify God when people shame us for our beliefs, for our faith. And so we should not be ashamed to suffer for Christ. We should not feel that shame. I feel fear far too often we do, don't we? We're worried about what others are going to think. Next thing that Peter says, he says, it gives this very interesting uh, two verses here in 17 and 18. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And what he really is, is trying to get at here is that, that believers should be prepared for the coming of the Lord. Really, everybody should be prepared for the coming of the Lord because he will come. In fact, we're going to proclaim that in communion here in a little bit. That as much, often as we drink this cup and take this bread, we declare the coming of the Lord. We know it's here. But he says, listen, for the time of judgment to begin at the household of God. Now, the the term here, judgment, is not what we typically think in terms of what Peter's trying to get after here. He says, listen, there is a time for the, the house of God to be purified and cleansed. And it begins with God's people. And this would hearken back to the day of the temple and the tabernacle where the the cleansing and the purifying of the people would happen with God's people first, those present in the midst of the gathering there, and then it would go out everywhere else. And Peter here is saying, listen, it's time for that to begin. The purifying and cleansing of God's people begins there at the household of God, but it will go out. And what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel? He says, listen, and he quotes uh, Psalm 26 here. He says, if the righteousness is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? And scarcely here is not like, ooh, I got by just barely. Like, whoo, just got in. It's kind of more of a, it's really difficult. And only one could accomplish it. And he did on our behalf. As Christ did. Because it was a very difficult thing. And he says, listen, you need to prepare for the coming of the Lord. This is what we should be declaring to others in our everyday lives. God desires for his people to recognize that that there is a a purifying effect when you are part of the household of God. Last thing he says, not just for us to prepare, not just for us to to suffer well, not for us not to be ashamed, not for us not to suffer for sinful acts, but this last thing, and he just, he sums up all three of his um, teachings throughout the book of 1 Peter here in verse 19, and it is 
it is quickly becoming one of my favorite verses as I just root it deep within my soul and impress it upon my heart. He says, listen, in light of being united to Christ and entering into His suffering, be blessed. He says, listen, entrust your soul to the faithful Creator while doing good. Entrust to, to give one's self one to give something to another. You're entrusting them with something. You ever done that? I mean, any of us, and every of us, we're entrusting the care of our bodies to our doctors, aren't we? And if you don't trust your doctor, what do you do? In our consumeristic society, we go to a different doctor. Okay? But you're entrusting your care. There's a, a way in which you're going, you know what, I have an ailment, and I, I'm entrusting, I'm handing over the management and care of my body to a professional person who understands the body in a little bit better way than I do at least from a scientific standpoint. But you know your body pretty well, actually, right? But you're handing it over. And this is what, what Peter here is getting at. He's saying, listen, therefore, in light of, of everything that I've talked about, in light of being united to Christ, in light of entering into his suffering, in light of being blessed when others revile you, you and me, we as a people, those who follow Christ should entrust or hand over our souls to the faithful creator God who has been faithful in all of time. We can trust Him. Every one of His promises He has completed to this day. And by the way, just in case you don't know, He'll do it again tomorrow and the day after, and the day after, until every one of His promises are a yes and amen. Notice, there's a little caveat here. This is for those who suffer according to God's will. Your, your suffering, our suffering, it has a purpose. It has a purpose. And this goes back to verse 1. A fiery trial... That is a test. The suffering of the saints is a refining fire that the Lord uses to grow us in His image. Your sufferings have purpose and meaning. Paul even hints at this in 2 Corinthians where he says this momentary affliction is creating a weight of... There is a purpose. We don't always know it. But the Lord has far greater wisdom and vision than our, for our refining than we could ever imagine. But Peter reminds us lastly that it's not just passivity. We're not just to sit back while suffering occurs. Look what he says. He said, therefore, let those suffer according to God's word. They, the active word here is entrust their souls to a faithful creator. And then look what we're doing. While doing good. We are to entrust ourselves to our faithful God while we do the good works that Ephesians chapter 1 tells us God has set ahead of us for us to walk in. While we do good, we are trusting our souls to the stewardship of our Creator while simultaneously doing good. Suffering and doing good are not mutually exclusive. Hear that. If you're suffering this morning, that does not exclude you from doing good. If you're walking through difficulty this morning, if somebody's persecuting you for your faith, that doesn't excuse us from doing good works in the midst of that. I'm fearful that far too often I've even had in my own mindset, woe is me, I can't do anything, I'm just going to sit here, I'm going to put on my sackcloth and ashes, and I'm just going <laughs> to pout all over about how frustrated I am about it. I'm still called to do good in the midst of that. Do good while suffering. There's this tension that Peter holds here in the midst of this verse. And in the midst of it, if we are trusting our life, in the midst of it, we are to trust our, entrust our life and soul to our Creator for our good and for His glory. We are to be those who rejoice in our suffering as we entrust ourselves to a faithful God. Our suffering is not in vain. And Peter reminds us that we are to rejoice in our suffering as it points to the day when we ultimately rejoice in the glory of Christ. Christ is our example in suffering. The one who entrusted himself to his faithful father while he suffered for doing good. And this morning, we, we actually get an opportunity to enter into, to, to remind ourselves about this suffering. 
about how our Savior suffered while doing good. In, in communion this morning, we declare Christ's suffering and His atonement on our behalf. We declare our allegiance to our suffering King. That's what we're doing this morning, a, a means of grace that, that, that that's the communion is that reminds us of the suffering of our King, that He suffered while doing good, and declare that we are not ashamed to be united to Him. For to be ashamed and to drink this cup is to drink judgment upon ourselves. And so we need to make sure to examine our hearts as those who come rightly to the cup professing Christ as Savior. The Lord's table is a part of our declaration that we are united to Christ. 